tasks. Okay. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, seminar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Titus uh, Lupu from CRS, and uh, he will tell us about exact identities for the metric graph of Gaussian free field. Thanks, Titus. Uh, thank you, Shin, for this introduction and for inviting me to this uh, seminar. And today, uh, my talk will be sort of an uh, sort of an overview uh, on uh, the Gaussian free field on the metric graph, and in particular, what is uh, uh, everything which which has to do with uh, exact identities. So, in a sense, with integrability. And uh, there will be some uh, more recent results and uh, some more ancient results. And well, it will be mo most of most of it will be my work or my work with collaborators. But uh, I will also mention some results obtained uh, uh, by other people uh, on this topic. Uh, so just to uh, summarize it all, uh, so. Uh, the metric graph GFF is, uh, uh, I will detail it, but it's uh, like a natural extension of the discrete GFF and uh, you get a continuous Gaussian field satisfying a Markov property. And it turns out that there are uh, some exact identities which are available, available for this metric graph GFF. Now this is due to continuity and uh, the analog of uh, these identities is not uh, I mean, it's not known and probably doesn't exist for the discrete GFF. And also I would like to stress that uh, none of the identities I will present is specifically related to the planarity. So, I mean, we, the like uh, planar duality is not used at all and uh, the identities work uh, like for abstract uh, electrical networks. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if you take uh, that continuum limit in the dimension two, uh, you recover uh, some of the identities uh, that are ha that have been known for the continuum two D, two two D Gaussian free field, and uh, these identities in continuum two D were obtained through SLE techniques, and in a sense, this suggests that while in dimension two, uh, this stuff you computed with SLE like explicitly uses, uh, the method explicitly uses uh, the conformal invariance. Uh, the identity itself actually is more general and is not related as such to conformal invariance or to uh, planarity. Uh, so what is, uh, uh, okay, I will start like by defining uh, the discrete GFF. So we take a finite and directed graph, which we see like an electrical network and we put conductances on the edges and for the vertices like we will take uh, there will be interior vertices like with this v interior and boundary vertices which i denote like uh, v boundary and we will take a boundary condition for our uh, discrete uh, free field and so the distribution is uh, given uh, here by um, i don't know how to can I do that? Uh, do you see something? Can I do that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah you see something. Uh, yeah, so so here is uh, the density of this uh, Gaussian free field. So it's Gaussian, it's like Gaussian field on your lattice. Um, okay, and how do we get the metric graph GFF? So first of all, we replace uh, the discrete edges of the graph by continuous lines line segments and the lengths will be given by the resistance, which is the inverse of the conductance. And so uh, here on this picture, you sort of have to look, uh, look at it as in sort of 3D. What you see in black here are your is your grid. Here it's a 2D grid. And, and now you want uh, like in green, what you see in green are, are is the height of the uh, discrete GFF. So the values of the discrete GFF on the vertices. And what we do, we in, interpolate uh, inside the edges, which are now continuous lines, uh, by uh, like conditionally independent Brownian bridges. And that's what you see here in orange. And by doing that, uh, the field you get, well, is continuous. It's also Gaussian. And it still has uh, the Markov property. So like you can cut inside uh, the edge lines and uh, still like uh, get uh, 
what's inside of the domain or you, you have cut is conditionally independent from the outside given the values uh, and the boundaries when you, where you do your cuts. Uh, and yes, so what's uh, the point of introducing this object? So like, well, just as the continue, uh, just as the discrete GFF, the metric graph GFF uh, approximates in the scaling plane of the continuum GFF, but it has some exact identities which are not available for the discrete one. And also like for the metric graph GFF, uh, we have uh, more interfaces we can observe. Uh, and uh, these interfaces uh, like, uh, in, like in dimension two, uh, there are proofs that uh, they uh, do converge to like uh, CLE4 processes. Um, and uh, for instance, if you take, uh, you can consider in dimension two, the sort of the sign components, like the sign clusters of the metrograph GFF. And these do converge, like if you look at the outer boundaries to the CLE4, that's what I proved, and this <coughs> is related to the miller sheffield coupling. And if you do like the sign components of the discrete GFF, uh, like it is supposed to converge to something else, which is uh, this, ALE, which means arc loop ensemble. And uh, the relation between the discrete and the metric graph GFF is very uh, analogous in a very precise sense uh, between, uh, very analogous to the relation between the spin easing field and the FK easing field. And I will explain that. Um, right, and yeah, and also like uh, the level uh, components, like the level sets of the metric graph GFF are much better understood that the level sets are of the discrete GFF and they are also easier to study. And there are works by also like some results by myself, by uh, John Ding and Matteo Wirth and by the team Trevitz, Prevo and Rodriguez. And uh, let me just show you a picture. So what uh, here, I, uh, here you see a 2D grid, like a 2D square grid. Uh, here are the black dots are your boundary conditions. So I put uh, them to zero. And what I represented with colors red and blue are like uh, the signs uh, of uh, the Gaussian free field the, on the metric graph, on the associated metric graph. So you see like it enters uh, inside uh, the edges and um, uh, like uh, what I did in a uh, bold, uh, like bold uh, lines is when uh, uh, the sign of the free field does not change inside the edge. And of course you have uh, edges where it does change inside the edge, it goes from negative to positive or vice versa is the argument. Or it can be more complicated stuff. And what I want, would like to point out that uh, the clusters you get on the metrograph, they are not equal to the clusters you see in discrete because a change of sign can occur uh, just inside uh, the edges, like in the interior of the edges, like here. So at both endpoints, you have a positive value, but uh, then uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, I mean, you change to you have uh, some negative values. And so this creates a disconnection on the metrograph. And, uh, and actually this effect, it has a macroscopic influence. So if you took, just look at this large scale, uh, the clusters uh, you see on the metrograph, they are macroscopically smaller than the clusters you get uh, uh, at the discrete level uh, because of these like interruptions you get inside the edges. And um, well, for instance, if you look at uh, dimension two, uh, so for the clusters uh, on the metrograph, your scaling limit will be given by the CLE4. And here is, I mean, here this, this is the famous fee picture done by David Wilson, it's computer simulation of CLE4. And uh, the scaling limit of uh, the clusters you see for the discrete uh, GFF is this arc loop ensemble. And this is a simulation by Brent uh, Vernus and like, in both cases, your like uh, interfaces locally look like SLE4 curves, but only in this, in the case of CLE4, uh, your loops uh, do not touch the boundary and do not touch each other. 
while, while in the case of arc loop ensemble, like uh, your interfaces, they do touch the boundary and you have a bipartite structure, like you, it's boundary, you go from negative to positive. Like if you cross here, while here you go from negative to zero or from uh, positive to zero. So it's not like uh, the same values on, the both, on both sides of the interfaces. Uh, right, so uh, as I said, this relation between discrete and metrograd GFF is very analogous to the relation between uh, spin easing and uh, FK easing random cluster. So uh, I re re recall the spin easing model. So you, on your graph, you have a random field which takes values minus one or one, which are spin projections. And while well, you can put the weights on edges, GXY will be a weight on edge, on the edge, on, an, on the edge XY. And so the probability of uh, uh, like an easing configuration, let's say with free boundary, uh, you get uh, exponential of this energy, which is your sum over the neighbors, GXY, sigma X, sigma uh, Y. And you have a partition function. And you also have versions of uh, easing uh, configurations with some fixed boundary conditions where you fix the value of the spins on the boundary. Right. And uh, for the FK easing, uh, so it's a, the random cluster model with. Uh, uh, so FK easing is the random cluster model with uh, Q equal two. Uh, so it's a configuration on the edges. Edges I are either closed, which I denote by zero, or open, which I denote by one. And the weight, I mean, the probability of the configuration, you put one minus exponential minus two times of this weight J for the open edges, exponential minus two J for the closed edges. But then you have this term two to the power of the number of your open clusters. So it's not it's not a Bernoulli percolation because of this two to the power of the not open clusters, and you have a normalization constant. And now uh, the relation between the uh, the two models. So uh, first of all, you have a relation for the, the partition function. So it's a combinatorial. The partition function of uh, the Ising model equals the partition functions of the FK Ising times you take the product over the edges of the exponential the weight g. Or, um, chain maybe, and uh, there is a probabilistic coupling. So if you sample an FK easing configuration, you like uh, then uh, put uh, for each open cluster or uh, choose a sign one or minus one independently with equal probability, and then the configuration of sign you get is your uh, spin easing field. And also you have a version of this coupling where you put, uh, so this is for free boundary conditions and you have a version where you put some non-free boundary conditions. Uh, like on the is spin easing side, you have to put boundary conditions uh, which are like non-negative uh, uh, or non-positive, but you don't, but you must not mix boundary values with opposite signs. Okay, so that's uh, the relation to the Gaussian free field. Uh, well, like, well, first, like if you take the discrete Gaussian free field, which lives on the vertices and you condition by the absolute value uh, on the vertices. So then you look at the conditional distribution of the signs and this uh, conditional distribution is in uh, easing field with uh, weights uh, J, uh, which depend on the absolute value of the free field. So the weights uh, J are given by the conductance times of the absolute value at x times of the absolute value of y. And uh, this uh, comes just from expanding this uh, square phi y minus phi x squared, like uh, the density you get this. Uh, now uh, for the metrograph, so phi tilde is your metrograph GFF, and now you define your edge configurations uh, like following. Uh, you put, uh, you say an edge is open if, uh, uh, if uh, the metrograph GFF does not hit zero inside the inside the line associated to this edge, and it is closed otherwise, so it is closed if it hits uh, zero somewhere on the edge line. And uh, now, uh, if you condition by the absolute value of the free field on the vertices, 
this random configuration of uh, edges is distributed as an FK easing uh, model with weights uh, J again given by the same thing as previously. So the conductance times uh, the absolute value of uh, the field at both endpoints. And moreover, uh, so the coupling you get uh, between uh, this configuration of edges and the sign of the free field on the vertices, it's uh, the same coupling as previously between uh, FK easing and spin easing, which is, uh, by the way, the Edwards uh, so called coupling. Uh, so, yeah, so this is the relation, uh, precise relation uh, to the, uh, this Edwards so called coupling. Uh, now, uh, uh, now I'll start presenting some exact identities which are known for the net free field on the metric graph. So I will start by some very simple ones. So uh, let's take uh, the metric graph GFF to have zero boundary conditions. And we look at the probability that two points X and Y are connected by non-zero values of the free field. That is to say that they are in the same uh, sign cluster of uh, the metric graph free field. Uh, this is given just by the expectation of the two signs uh, of the product of two signs at X and Y, which uh, can first uh, write down as two pi times of this arc sign and GXY is your Green's function, which gives you the covariance. And uh, indeed, like if uh, on the event uh, uh, that they are connected by uh, non-zero values, uh, the signs at both points have to be the same, so the product is one. And on the event where the X and Y are not connected, then uh, the signs are equal or uh, opposite with equal probability. So if you take the average, you get zero. And so we keep only the event when they are connected. Another very simple identity. Now you imagine you have uh, your metric graph GFF has uh, non-negative non boundary conditions. Now you look at the event that you take a point X somewhere in your metric graph and you look at the event that you're connected to the boundary by positive values of the free field. Well, uh, the probability of this event is just uh, the expectation of the sign of the free field at your point X. And since you have a non-zero boundary condition, your free field is no longer centered. And so this expectation, like it's this, uh, where HUX is the value of the harmonic extension at X, so it's your average value of the free field. And again, indeed, if you are not connected by positive values, if you are connected by positive values uh, to the boundary, then your sign is necessarily one. But if you are not, then your sign is it's either one or minus one with equal probability. So the average you get just the probability of this event. Uh, now uh, let's look at something more um, complicated. So we divide, uh, now we divide the boundary of our domain in three parts, uh, uh, part one, part two, and part uh, zero. And the part zero might be empty, so it might, well, doesn't matter. And we put positive boundary conditions on part one and part two and zero boundary conditions on, on the part zero. This is what I, denote, what I denoted by U. And U star is uh, the boundary condition where we flip uh, the sign of the boundary conditions on part two. So we keep the same sign on part one, on zero, on part zero, we still have zero. And on part two, we just take the opposite sign. So we flip the sign. Okay, and now we look at uh, the probability that uh, our metric graph uh, GFF connects by positive value uh, the boundary, uh, part one of the boundary with part two of the boundary. And this event, uh, its probability is given by two partition functions, like uh, on the numer numerator, we have the partition function. Uh, I mean, it's so the complementary that you are not connected. And the probability on the numerator, you get the partition function of the free field with boundary values U star, and on the denominator, the partition function of the free field with boundary values U. So you get a ratio of two Gaussian integrals. 
And you can also express it using the boundary Poisson kernel, your discrete boundary Poisson kernel. So exponential minus two, and then you integrate uh, where one point is on part one and the other point in part two, and you do ux, uy, hx, y. And moreover, if you condition by this event that you do not have a pro positive crossing from part one to part two, the absolute value of the free field with boundary condition u has the same distribution of this, so the absolute value of the free field where you flipped the boundary conditions on one of, on one of the sides. And uh, so, like, and for, uh, but I would like to point out that we do not, we do not have an analogous expression if we, we start to mixing uh, opposite values in our boundary conditions. So, for instance, if in part zero, instead of having zero, we put something which is negative, uh, then, uh, I mean, we don't get, at least I don't know an exact expression for this connection event. And here is just a picture to illustrate that. So like uh, uh, you have uh, like part one of the boundaries, your, uh, it's your left boundary, part two is your right boundary, part zero is top and bottom, and you have zero boundary condition on top and bottom and positive on left and right. And you look at this precise at this event that we have a positive crossing from left to right, like here as in the picture. And uh, well, the complementary here is the complementary. You don't have positive crossings from left to right. And what I say, if once you're conditioned by not having this positive crossing, the absolute value you get is the same as if you flipped the boundary conditions on one of uh, the sides. So here on the right, you flip the boundary condition. And by the way, this is not planar. Like uh, you can also like it works on any graph, and you can take your box in ZD and uh, get uh, the similar formula. And now this formula, I mean, it has an equivalent in continuum. Uh, okay, you take your simply connected uh, domain in 2D, you cut uh, the boundary in four parts, you put something positive, then zero, then something else positive, then put zero. And uh, what you do is you draw your SLE type level lines, which join Okay, you have you have two points, and you have then you have two lines, and this uh, two interfaces uh, they can join uh, these uh, four points uh, in two different ways. Uh, so one way is uh, like that. Uh, so here we have a level line. So on one side you have zero, on the other side you have this uh, uh, two lambda. Oh, by the way, it's false. Uh, the button what you get. Uh, okay. Uh, I messed uh, the boundary values, you should have two lambda here and zeros below. Uh, okay, this is one possibility of connecting, and this is the other possibility for connecting uh, these uh, four points. And uh, well, uh, the probability of this event is exactly given by this uh, formula. You can do the computation with uh, your SLE, SLE4, and you get uh, exactly this. Uh, uh, probability with boundary Poisson kernel for uh, for this event. Uh, now you have also some exact probability for events that involve uh, more uh, topology. Uh, this is my recent work. So, uh, for instance, you, you consider that your graph uh, has an annular shape. So, like, okay, it's some two D domain discrete, uh, but it has a hole. And uh, well, okay, and I put uh, boundary conditions both on the outer uh, boundary and inner boundary. And now uh, like there are two options. Uh, either you have one of the sign components of your free field on the metric graph uh, that uh, disconnects uh, in, a, in the topological sense of the inner boundary and the outer boundary. And that's the picture on the right. So on the right, we have like a positive cluster which turns around the inner hole, or you don't have that, and that's uh, the picture on the left. You have no sign clusters, which make turns around the inner hole. And it turns out that uh, there is a formula for this, uh, the probability of this event. And uh, to formalize this, we will need to introduce uh, 
uh, I mean, a bit of notions related to gauge theory. So our gauge group here will be just uh, the group minus one, one, the multiplicative group minus one, one. And our gauge field, so will be, we will put uh, like signs minus one or one on the edges. Okay, and once we do that, we have also gauge transformations. So if you put uh, minus one or plus one on uh, the vertices, then you transform your uh, signs on the edges by saying that sigma hat acts on, acts on sigma by multiplying uh, the sign you get on the edge by the two signs you get at the two endpoints. So sigma hat x, sigma x, y, sigma hat y. And once you have such a transformation, we say, we say that uh, sigma hat and uh, the image of sigma hat, uh, and we say that sigma and the image of sigma by sigma hat are gauge equivalent. And uh, I mean, there is a notion of holonomy. So if you take a nearest neighbor path, like discrete nearest neighbor path, the holonomy of sigma along this path, you just multiply the signs of the edges visited uh, by, uh, by the path and you count uh, with multiplicity of uh, visits. And uh, then you can uh, look at the holonomies of closed loops and it's easy to see that uh, uh, two gauge fields are gauge equivalent if and only if the holonomy along each closed loop is the same. And like here are like two pictures. Uh, uh, well, what is invalid are the edges with sign minus one. So on this picture on the top left, uh, it's uh, the trivial gauge. You, you put one everywhere on every edge. And uh, on the top uh, right, I put some edges. I put signs minus one to some edges. But it turns out that uh, this gauge, uh, which has minuses, it's actually gauge equivalent to the like to the trivial gauge. And here, like, is a picture of the corresponding gauge transformation. And the idea is that, well, when you turn like uh, around the inner hole, you always get plus one. But now, uh, I, uh, let's see some non-trivial gauges. So on the top left. Uh, uh, you get to your holonomy now is minus one if you turn and each time you turn once around uh, the inner hole. So now it's not uh, it's not a uh, gauge equivalent to the trivial uh, gauge because of that. And on the top right is another uh, gauge, but it's uh, is another gauge field, but it's equivalent to uh, the one on the left. And on the bottom is uh, the explicit gauge transformation from one to the other. And you can do that if you have like several holes, for instance, here we have two holes. And if you like put your, I mean, this is, these are called defect lines. If you put your defect line, which joins uh, the two holes it's the same as putting two defect lines from each of the holes of the point. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, now, uh, we can uh, define uh, the discrete Gaussian free field twisted by this uh, gauge field sigma. So instead of, uh, so in your, uh, how is to say it in your Hamiltonian, instead of putting phi y minus phi x squared, you multiply phi y by this value of uh, the gauge field on the edge. So it's sigma x y phi y minus phi x squared. And uh, so you get a Gaussian field, which is this uh, gauge twisted free field. And uh, your gauge equivalence uh, corresponds to a deterministic uh, uh, transformation in the, your Gaussian fields. And now your uh, gauge twisted uh, discrete Gaussian free field, it has a natural extension to the metric graphs. And well, uh, this natural extension is uh, no longer a continuous field, it will have discontinuities and I take the convention that our, uh, the discontinuities are localized uh, in the middle of edges uh, that have sign minus one for the gauge. And the discontinuities of the type when you go, uh, uh, the left limit is the opposite uh, of the right limit. So in this way, the, the absolute value is continuous, but if you take the signs, you will get this uh, discontinuity. Uh, well, here is a picture. So I did uh, 
uh, if taken precisely this uh, gauge uh, where you get holonomy minus one once you turn when you turn once around the inner hole and here is uh, the free metrograph refilled with this uh, gauge and you have this defect line uh, corresponds to these violet dots which join uh, the inner hole and the outer hole, and you flip the sign once you cross one of these violet dots. So this creates more discontinuity. Um, well, because of this, this discontinuity, I mean, the right uh, object to look at is a, a double cover of your graph. Uh, so if you want something continuous, so, uh, yeah, okay, your gauge field sigma, will define a particular double cover of your initial graph. And you take two copies of your graphs, graph, but um, for edges that uh, are uh, one, have value one for the gauge field sigma, you just uh, do the parallel like uh, links. And for edges which uh, have value minus one, you do, you link it in a uh, like in a crossed way. And for instance, here, if you take this uh, graph, this square with a diagonal, you put one on the sides of your square and you put minus one on the diagonal. When you look at the double cover, uh, so you have two squares uh, and uh, well, uh, the, like, uh, the sides which are plus one, you do the parallel links, but the diagonal it has minus one, so the cross, so you you join uh, a corner of one square to the corner of uh, the other square. And you do something here like that. And uh, well, yeah, and now you can take uh, the associated metrograph or the metrograph associated to this double cover. And if you can define a continuous Gaussian field on this double cover, uh, which uh, such that you have opposite values uh, on on one, uh, how's it called, a leaf of your uh, cover and on the other one. So if you do your uh, double cover automorphism, which exchange your leaves, your leaves, your you multiply your field by minus one. And uh, yeah, and you get uh, uh, your, your metrograph GFF, uh, this gauge twisted metrograph GFF on the base by taking uh, a section of your double cover and taking uh, the value of this uh, continuous free field on the double cover. And because your section is not continuous, so you get this discontinuities. And now uh, the result is the following. So you, among all the fields which live on your base, so on your base metrograph, uh, which are well, like you look at, conti uh, at your continuous fields. Uh, you define a subset of these fields such that um, uh, for uh, every uh, connected component of the non zero set of F, F is your field, the image, uh, the image of this connected component in the double cover. So, you take, you take the inverse image with a projection on the double cover and this inverse image has to be connected. So in general, it's either connected or it has two connected components. And we, uh, in, in this uh, subset, we require that for every uh, uh, sign cluster, the inverse image in only the double cover is connected. So what does this mean? Uh, so if you take this example of, uh, uh, of this uh, annular domain. Uh, if you take a, a connected uh, sign cluster, which does not uh, cross, uh, does not, uh, sorry, which that does not surround uh, the inner, uh, the inner hole, if you look uh, it's at its inverse image on the double cover, you get just two disconnected copies. But now if you have something that does surround the inner hole, uh, and when you look at the uh, on the double cover, you get something connected because when you turn once, uh, you do not uh, on the double cover, you do not come back to the same point. You actually go to the other leaf, to the second leaf, and you have to turn twice to return to the to your initial point. 
So uh, the inverse image on the double cover of this uh, thing that surrounds the inner hole is actually connected. And uh, so, I mean, this is the precise, I mean, this is a way to phrase this so that you do not surround your hole. Um, okay, and uh, first of all, uh, if you take uh, uh, the absolute value of the gauge twisted free field on the metrograph, it is in this uh, particular set, which means that all of its uh, uh, non zero connected components uh, are trivial for your gauge sigma. So if you look back on the double cover, you get just uh, two disconnected copies for each of them. And uh, one way to see that is that. Uh, uh, precisely, yes, if you take, uh, if this were not the case, uh, then uh, you would uh, get, a, you would have a continuous path on your double cover, which, join, which joins uh, one leaf and uh, the image uh, on the other leaf. And, uh, and along this path, your absolute value would be always uh, strictly positive. And because your field on the double cover is continuous, so it means that it has to, uh, uh, to, to keep constant sign along this path. But at the same time, it has opposite signs on, uh, on the point and on, on the other point, uh, I mean, and on the symmetric point of the double cover. So this is impossible. So this is like, uh, I mean, this thing here is just like a triviality if you look at the level of double cover. And now what I say is that you look at the usual uh, free field, uh, metrograph free field on your base space. So no longer gauge twisted, but your usual one. And the probability that uh, all of its assigned clusters are trivial for the gauge sigma, you express it as the ratio of two partition functions. One of the partition functions is the partition function for the gauge twisted free field. And the other partition function is uh, the partition function for the usual free field. And you also can express it as uh, the ratio of uh, two determinants of discrete Laplacians at the power one half. So the numerator, you get the usual discrete Laplacian and uh, the uh, denominator, you get the, uh, the gauge twisted discrete Laplacian. And um, conditionally on this event, so we have the probability of this event and uh, conditional on this event, the the absolute value of your usual metrograph free field is di distributed as the absolute value of the gauge twisted free field. Okay, and uh, to prove this result, so I won't detail it, but I mean, there are two approaches. What I did in my paper is uh, it uses only like a sort of Gaussian computations and uh, well, a bit of stochastic calculus, some uh, arguments using Radon Kadim derivatives and only Gaussian computations. But actually, uh, there is a very similar result which holds for the FK easing model. And because of uh, the relation between uh, the free field uh, combinatorics and uh, the easing combinatorics, you can actually derive this result for the free field from the result you get for the, from the FK easing. And actually, the two are equivalent. Uh, the advantage is that in the free field, you get explicit partition functions, which are like determinants of Laplacians. For the FK easing uh, model, your partition functions are less explicit, so like that. Okay, uh, just to draw, uh, okay, so this is in the, you know, on the metrograph, and well, you, I, what I explained it like, well, the, I illustrated this with some uh, planar uh, pictures, but I mean, you uh, have this kind of result also in multidimensional case, uh, it, except it's more uh, complicated to interpret what uh, this event uh, T sigma means exactly. But uh, the, uh, the analog of this result is not related to planarity. But now let's uh, look at what happens in a continuum. So you should take the free field, uh, continuum free field on the analogs, and you take, let's say, uh, zero boundary conditions. Uh, and you look at the level lines with step uh, two lambda. 
So you may have level lines which uh, like disconnect the inner boundary from the outer boundary. And the probability that such level lines, uh, topologically non-trivial level lines, uh, do not exist. Actually, again, I mean, uh, the expression of this probability is known with the 2D continuum case, and one can check uh, that it's again given by this ratio of determinants. I actually get, uh, you take uh, uh, zeta regularized determinants in continuum, and you get uh, this probability is uh, the ratio of uh, two and zeta are regularized uh, determinants of the Laplacian. Uh, well, by the way, uh, I mean, showing that the probability you compute using like uh, your SLE techniques uh, equals uh, this ratio of zeta regularized determinants is not completely trivial. It's like an exercise on theta, uh, theta functions, but it's a computation to see that it's also equals to that ratio. And now if you um, look at the case where you do not get uh, logically non-trivial level lines, uh, then uh, you're, uh, I mean, you get this uh, CLE4 inside the analyst uh, conditioned on, have, on having only topologically trivial stuff, uh, on tro topologically trivial loops. And uh, right, and now, uh, well, you can, have values uh, two lambda or minus two lambda for each of the loop uh, with equal probability. And if you use this as, and if you just sample independent free fits with these boundary conditions inside each loops, what you get is, is a condition Gaussian free field. So, well, most likely it's not Gaussian because it's a condition Gaussian. But now what can you do? You take a deterministic defect line somewhere which joins the inner boundary and the outer boundary, so uh, here in violet. And uh, if you take this uh, defect line and you multiply, uh, and because uh, your loops are topologically trivial, they have a bipartite uh, structure. So uh, 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 you can assign uh, for each uh, like, each, you can assign uh, assign plus one or minus one uh, for each of, of these connected components of loops, which are cut by your defect line in a way that when you cross the defect line, you take the opposite sign. Uh, this is what I represented on the picture. And so you arbitrarily assign this signs plus and minus in a way to, to flip the sign each time you cross the defect line and you multiply by these signs your uh, free fields inside the loops. And when you do this construction, uh, I mean by convergence from the metrograph, you get that for the field you construct this way, it is exactly Gaussian and it is this uh, gauge twisted Gaussian free field in continuum. And uh, uh, that's, this is what you get by taking the scaling limit from the metrograph. And by the way, uh, could you prove that with, without using uh, the metrograph like directly in continuum? This I don't know. Uh, let me present some more, uh, uh, some older results uh, which have to do with uh, the expressions for the effective resistances in the metrograph. Um, okay, so uh, I present something different, but also which has to do with exact identities. So. Again, I take uh, the metrograph free field and I put some uh, non-negative boundary condition and I look at the first passage set of level zero. So I start from the boundary and I discover everything I can reach by positive values. Now this is uh, this uh, set A tilde A tilde A zero. And I look at the Green's function on the domain of the complementary of tilde A0. And there is also this harmonic extension of the boundary bias. And now uh, this is an old result obtained by myself and Wendelin. So if you take a point X inside your metric graph and you look at, so uh, the effective resistance from X to this first passage set, and this effective resistance is precisely the Green's function gxx in the whole domain minus the Green's function in the domain cut in the complementary of your first passage set. And uh, well, this uh, effective resistance, its distribution equals to the distribution uh, of a uh, first passage of, of, of the first uh, 
passage time of one dimensional Brownian motion, you look at the first time your Brownian motion hits at the level minus hux, where hux is the harmonic extension at x of the boundary values. And here we have to take uh, like the minimum with the Green's function uh, gxx, uh, because uh, you have a positive probability that your point x is actually in inside the first passage set. Um, well, uh, this uh, well uh, identity, I mean, it has uh, it has its analog in 2D continuum. So the first passage sets have a scaling limit to the continuum. This is what we proved with Luhan and Avelio. And uh, if you take the continuum of the first passage set and you put, take a point somewhere, uh, Z somewhere in your domain, uh, your ratio, one over two pi of the logarithm of your ratio of conformal radii, you look at the conformal radii, right, radius seen from Z of your whole domain and uh, of the complementary of the first passage set. Again, it's given by the heating time. It has the same distribution of the heating time uh, of a 1D Brownian motion. And this, uh, like uh, this uh, log conformal radius, is just uh, the limit of these differences of Green's functions. Uh, well, a similar result uh, obtained by uh, Drevitz, Prevot, and Rodriguez. What they look at is uh, you take uh, well, metric graph uh, free field with zero boundary condition. You fix some non-negative level a and you and the point x inside your metric graph. And you look uh, at your connected and the connected components component of X of the level set where the metric graph free field is above level A. So you look at all the points Y you can reach inside the metric graph by uh, taking only the values of the free field uh, which are larger than A. And uh, and what they look at is the effective conductance between this uh, connected level set of X and the boundary of your uh, metric graph. And uh, the Laplace transform of, the, of this effective conductance, so well, here is this expression uh, that they obtained. And this is somehow also similar to this uh, previous result. And uh, maybe I have a few minutes. Uh, so there is another uh, like uh, exact uh, uh, type, a type of exact identity is known for the metric graph GFF, which have to do with uh, the Levy transformation. So if you take uh, the one dimensional Brownian motion, uh, so uh, there is a so-called Levy transformation. You look at uh, the local time at zero of your Brownian motion. And if you take the absolute value of the Brownian motion, like absolute value of BT and you subtract the local time at zero, uh, what you get is again distributed as a Brownian motion and uh, minus your local time at zero will be now the infimum of your Brownian motion. So, yes, so perhaps I don't know who it's that in this identity, but it's called Levy transformation. Uh, and you have actually an analog of the Levy transformation on the metric graph. Since your uh, values of the metric graphs are locally, they're like 1D Brownian motion. If you take a continuous path inside your metric graph, so gamma is your path, uh, you may look at the local time at zero of your metric graph free field along this path gamma. So what you do, uh, you look, um, uh, so uh, the portion of, uh, to the portion of the path where the, uh, the value of the free field is absolutely close to zero, uh, and you look at the length of this uh, of this portion of your path, and you renormalize it by one over to epsilon. And we, when you let epsilon go to zero, this converges to something, uh, uh, well, something non-trivial, which is the local time uh, of the free field at zero along this path come. And now what you do, if you take two points, x and y, you take, uh, the infimum of this local time along all possible paths which join x and y. So you do this uh, infimum. Uh, so so this local time is somehow the length of your path, and you uh, you take the infimum uh, along all possible paths of this random length. 
but uh, what it defines is actually it's not exactly a metric it's a pseudo metric which means that x might be different from y but uh, this distance still can still be zero and this distance uh, delta zero x y is zero if and only if either x equal y or or x and y are in the same sign component of your free field because if you're they are in the same sign component of your free field you can take uh, a path along which uh, like uh, the free field uh, stays always positive or always negative so the local time along this path path is zero so somehow this uh, pseudo metric it quotients uh, it identifies each uh, sign cluster to a single point Okay, so this defines you, uh, this pseudo metric. And now you can, what you look at is uh, this pseudo distance from a point X to the boundary of your domain, to the boundary of the metric graph. And now uh, if you take your free field with non-negative boundary conditions, you take the absolute value of the free field and you subtract this pseudo distance to the boundary. What you get is again, a metric graph uh, free field, which has the same uh, distribution. And somehow this is your generalization of your Levy transformation. And also like there are some exact identities related for to this distance, for instance, uh, like the, dis the pseudo distance between two points. I mean, the law of the pseudo distance between two points uh, is also explicit. Uh, I mean, it's complicated, but explicit expression, uh, which I won't, I won't display it here. And now uh, the reason we started this, we started this with, with Vendelin and the reason is that we believe that uh, this uh, pseudo distance, uh, pseudo metric has a scaling limit, non-trivial scaling limit in dimension two. Uh, and this scaling limit it's, is related to, so it's a conjecture, this scaling limit is related to uh, conformally invariant growth mechanism inside the CLE4 loop ensemble. Uh, and this growth mechanism, so it has been introduced uh, by Hao Wu in her PhD thesis. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you have your CLE4 loop ensemble, but then you, you have somehow a sort of a conformal invariant distance uh, uh, to between the CLE loops and uh, the boundary and also between uh, Two different CLE loops, and if you take uh, this, uh, uh, the distance to the boundary is given by the way. Uh, uh, so you grow the loops uh, somehow starting from you know, the boundary based on conformal uniformizations. Uh, this distance to the boundary is at the time where the uh, loop appeared. And uh, what how we showed is that uh, okay, you have this miller sheffield hub coupling where you put boundary values two lambda or minus two lambda with equal probability inside of each of your Sealy loops. But you have another coupling between the Sealy four and the free field where inside the Sealy each loop you put the, the boundary value two lambda, but you subtract to this time, uh, uh, this specific time of your Sealy four loop. And what we believe is that, uh, first of all, our like uh, generalization of uh, the Levy transformation of the metrograph is exactly the analog of this uh, second uh, coupling between the, the CLE4 and the free field. And, uh, and this times uh, T gamma, they should be the scaling limit of this uh, pseudo distance of your CLE4 loop to the boundary. Well, because on the metric graph, uh, I mean, your serially for loop will be just the outer boundary of a uh, sign cluster, and uh, the pseudo distance it identifies to one point your sign cluster, and you look at the distance to the boundary. Okay, and I, I think I will stop uh, here, and well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>